Price, performance, portability. Typically when buying a laptop, you can only choose two of the three. Want something fast and light? Well, that's gonna cost you extra. Want that speed to be better value? Prepare to feel the weight of that choice. Want something affordable and portable? You can have that, but at the cost of slower internals. Unfortunately, most of the time, laptops in today's market are positioned this way. Other times, however, we have devices like these. Eight cores, RTX graphics, 1.4 kilos, and a body that means business. All for a thousand US dollars. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Acer Swift X. So first impressions, and there's no other way to put it, this laptop is gorgeous. The sleek profile and thin bezels make this a thoroughly modern affair, while the combination of silver with black and gold accents is nothing short of sophisticated and refined, especially for a thousand dollar machine. Build quality is equally impressive, with a smooth metal finish throughout the laptop providing solid rigidity. Both the screen and the keyboard deck don't show much flex, but towards the front of the keyboard deck there is quite a bit. This is because of the keyboard's pivoting design, where opening the laptop lid, which by the way can easily be opened with one hand, raises the front end of the keyboard deck slightly. Now this can improve airflow around the bottom intake vent for better thermals, but at the cost of reduced structural rigidity at the front of the laptop. But you're not really going to be pressing hard at that area, so I don't think you'll notice this. What you will notice though is how compact this machine is. Weighing in at just 1.4 kilos with a thickness of 17.9 millimeters, this 14 inch device can easily be carried around in a backpack for long periods of time, and its felt appearance means you won't stick out in any office or classroom environment. Despite it not being crazy thin though, the Swift X doesn't come with the widest port selection, but there is a decent amount of them. With two 5 gigabit USB A's, a full size HDMI 2.0 out, an audio combo jack, and one 10 gigabit USB C that can also be used to charge the laptop at 65 watts, act as a display port output, or an Ethernet jack. Both display outs also connect to the CPU's IGP rather than the dedicated NVIDIA card, which is unfortunate, because as Gerard's tech reveals in this video, you can get a bit of a graphics performance boost if your display is connected to the NVIDIA graphics directly and it doesn't have to funnel data through the IGP. I was also disappointed to see the lack of an SD card reader, given that this is marketed towards creators, but the inclusion of a fingerprint reader for fast sign-ins is welcome. The webcam isn't bad either. It is grainy, but it's clear and colorful enough for video calls and the mic provides enough detail in my voice. The Swift X also comes with something called Acer Purified Voice, which suppresses background noise, and it's surprisingly effective. Here I am spamming the keyboard and you can barely hear it, and if I run a vacuum cleaner next to the laptop, you can still hear and understand it. It's ridiculous how well it works. NVIDIA also has their own implementation of this called RTX Voice, which does the same thing, but you do need to set it up yourself. So the fact that Purified Voice is already installed is awesome. Something that's not so awesome though is the upgradability. Now the disassembly itself was easy. Just remove 11 Torx T6 screws, which are all the same length, and pry the panel out from the corner near the hinge and work your way around the frame. But once inside, the first thing you'll notice is, Yes, we do have soldered RAM, which is not uncommon for a laptop of this size, though as of filming, there aren't any models with more than 16 gigs of RAM. For an ordinary Ultrabook, this wouldn't be too concerning, but given this is marketed towards creators as a portable powerhouse, this may end up hurting its potential for heavier users such as myself. On my desktop, for example, I can easily exceed 16 gigs of RAM while editing video. However, this does come with an extra M.2 slot, so if the included storage is not enough, you'll easily be able to add another drive without needing to swap them out. While upgradability is a mixed bag, the typing experience is top notch. Thanks to the slight upward pivoting of the keyboard deck, it's very comfortable to type on. The 1.3 millimeters of travel is a little shallower than what I'm used to, but this keyboard is still surprisingly satisfying to use with a pleasing weight and almost clicky feeling actuation. Impressive for such a low profile design. The no numpad layout is also fairly standard for a 13 to 14 inch device, so you shouldn't have a hard time adjusting when coming from another laptop of similar size. 
The keyboard also comes with white backlighting as standard, which can be activated using the F8 key. While quite strong, it can actually work against you in brighter environments. Because the keys are silver, if the surroundings are just at the right brightness, the text with backlighting on can be difficult to see from certain angles, so I leave it off in those situations. But in dark rooms, it lights up everything very well. It's also worth noting that while the lighting stays on while you type, it turns off when you haven't touched a key in some time. I'm not sure why it does this, but I thought it was worth mentioning because there's no way to leave it on constantly for whatever reason, even when plugged in. Another useful keyboard shortcut is FN and F, which swaps between silent, normal, and performance cooling modes. As you go to a higher mode, the fans get more sensitive to load and ramp up to a higher maximum RPM. Each profile also changes power limits slightly, but we'll explore that in a bit. Now, one thing I wasn't too keen on was that the power button is quite prone to accidental presses. It looks like an ordinary key while also being next to the delete key, which is used pretty frequently. These keys are also quite small, so if you have large fingers like I do, it's quite easy to slip off the delete key and press the power button by accident, causing the laptop to go to sleep. So be extra careful when pressing the delete key. Another thing I didn't really like was the trackpad actuation. Like many other trackpads, it gets harder to click going upwards, and it completely stops at about two-thirds the way up, which isn't really a surprise, but it generally requires more force than I'd like, even at the very bottom, which should require the least force. So I find myself tapping more often than pressing it. Aside from that though, the trackpad itself was nice to use. It has a smooth texture that's easy to glide your finger across even when sweaty, the tracking felt accurate with gestures working effortlessly as well, and as for the size, it's about average for this laptop class. Not the largest out there, but I never found myself feeling cramped when using it. Now, let's check out that screen. My model comes with a matte 1080p 60Hz IPS display from Qi Mei, and it's a great panel for this kind of laptop. Viewing angles are excellent as expected from an IPS display. A peak brightness of 320 nits on my unit means it's bright enough for outdoor use within a reasonably shaded area, and the matte coating ensures reflections won't be bothersome. Contrast was also above average for an IPS panel at about 1250 to 1, and backlight bleed was minimal. Colors are also vibrant on this panel thanks to good color coverage, coming in at 99.2% sRGB, making it great for daily use. Though, the limited 72.2% Adobe RGB and 75.8% DCI-P3 coverage may be a problem for some of you. The color accuracy, though, is exceptional. Out of the box, we have an average Delta E2000 of 0.92, with a max of 1.86, while the white point is ever so slightly warmer than daylight. Keep in mind, out of the box color accuracy won't be identical from unit to unit, but they will be similar. After calibration, we have even better results with an average Delta E2000 of 0.41 and a max of 1.44, while the white point remains virtually unchanged. What all this means is that if your workflow doesn't need a color gamut wider than sRGB, this panel will be perfect for you. Otherwise, you'll have to get an external monitor. Unfortunately, it doesn't fare too well for gaming either. First, like the display out, this panel is connected to the iGP with no ability to switch to the DGPU directly, which will hinder gaming performance slightly, as I mentioned earlier, but vastly improve battery life. It also has a sluggish 25 millisecond gray to gray response time and a very visible blur in this chase motion test. Though there is no inverse ghosting, which is good. Personally, I never really noticed the slow response time even in competitive games, and really, if you're after a laptop that you'll primarily use for gaming, you should probably look at something else, because aside from that slow response time, the 60Hz refresh rate of this panel won't be ideal either. Though, if you want an everyday laptop that can also game on the side if needed, this should be more than adequate as you'll see later on. For now though, let's check out the speakers. They are downward facing, but they can get surprisingly loud while still retaining detail in the treble frequencies, making it sound quite pleasing even if there's almost no bass. There was, however, noticeable audio latency. I measured about 300 milliseconds of lag, which isn't terrible for media consumption, but it is a little distracting when in fast-paced games. Here's what that lag sounds like in Modern Warfare.
so quite a noticeable delay between me clicking and the gun making any sound. After searching online, I found that you can get rid of the lag by disabling audio enhancements in the sound settings. Unfortunately, that completely ruins the audio, making everything sound muffled and tinny. So let's hear how this sounds now with audio enhancements turned on and off so you can hear the difference for yourself. And for that, I present Joel McHale and Jim Rash performing Kiss from a Rose. Take it away. As you just heard, there's a huge difference between the two modes. Enhancements make the speaker sound significantly better, but at the cost of lag. So for daily use, I'd leave the enhancements on for the best audio quality. For fast-paced games, latency matters a lot more than audio quality, and so I turn the enhancements off. For video editing though, I just get a good pair of headphones. Even if there was no audio latency, you need the best possible audio quality anyway, and so it doesn't really matter in this case. Overall, I'm liking this laptop so far. Though it doesn't have the widest port selection or the best upgradability, it's built well and looks beautiful, it has a great panel with unparalleled out-of-the-box color accuracy, a good keyboard and trackpad, and decently loud yet rich speakers, provided that enhancements are turned on. So good laptop, but at this point it doesn't feel much different than a regular premium thin and light. But that's about to change. Because if you look past its discrete exterior, you'll find that this machine is carrying some pretty potent hardware. My unit is the top of the range model with an 8 core 16 thread Ryzen 7 5800U, a 35 watt RTX 3050 Ti that can reach up to 40 watts with dynamic boost, 16 gigs of LPDDR4X 4266 in dual channel, a 512 gig HFM 512 GD3, you know what? It's an NVMe SSD from Hynix, whatever. Finally, we have a MediaTek MT7921 Wi-Fi module that provides dual-band AX Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5.0. As spec'd, this model costs $1,070 US dollars from Amazon or $1,000 US dollars from Acer's store at the time of filming. They also offer a model with a 5700U and GTX 1650, with all other specs equal to this thing for $1,000 US dollars as well, which isn't bad value, but there's no reason to buy that at that price unless this model is out of stock. As for more entry-level specs though, there currently isn't anything lower than the 5700U and 1650 model in the US unfortunately. In Hong Kong though, we have a 5500U and 1650 model which is no slouch either and that'll hopefully cost less than a thousand US dollars if it comes out in the US. If it's priced at about seven to eight hundred dollars, that would be difficult to ignore. Aside from different configurations, Acer also offers this laptop with two other color options, rose gold and blue gray, both of which look fantastic too. But as of filming, only gold seems to be available. Back to the specific model though. Given its specs, it should be of no surprise that this machine crushes all forms of heavy multitasking and productivity. The Hynix SSD that shall not be named because I don't want to read it is a capable performer as well, topping out at almost 3600 and 3000 megabytes per second sequential read and write, making it one of the fastest 500 gig Gen 3 SSDs out there, while our MediaTek Wi-Fi module leaves nothing to be desired in terms of speed either. Stability though was a bit of an issue because I had a couple of sudden disconnects. It sometimes can't find any Wi-Fi networks, and one time it even disappeared from Task Manager, as if I didn't even have a Wi-Fi module. Surprisingly though, after running the networking troubleshooter, it found that the module was configured incorrectly and reset it, and I haven't had a problem since. So if this ever happens to you, the fix is very straightforward. And as for the battery life, after my usual test of heavy multitasking with 80% screen brightness, keyboard lighting off, and power mode at better battery, I averaged about 5-6 to six hours each time. Now this isn't even within the ballpark of Acer's 17 hour estimate, but it's still impressive considering the hardware here. 5-6 to six hours isn't quite enough to last a whole workday, but you should be able to push it further by lowering the screen brightness and using battery saver mode. And now my friends, it's that time of the video again where we see how this laptop performs. You know what's coming. Benchmark. It's time for benchmarks, baby. And we begin with PC Mark 10, which tests your PC in a variety of typical office tasks. Now normally for this part, I would compare this laptop to the average laptop with the same specs to see where it stands. 
but because this laptop has such a unique blend of parts, there are no other devices with the same specs to compare it to, aside from maybe the ROG X13, but even that's a little bit different with its higher power HS processor. So what we're going to do instead is compare this against the average 5800H and 3050Ti laptop, along with the average 5800U laptop to see where it sits in between. And we're using performance mode for all these tests for the best cooling and performance. In PC Mark 10, it's a close fight between all the contenders in essentials and productivity, with less than a 10% difference between the SwiftX and rival systems. Digital content creation, however, showed the largest performance deltas as it's the most GPU dependent, with the SwiftX right in the middle of the pack achieving a 22% better score than the average 5800U system, but 17% worse than the average 5800H 3050Ti system. This makes sense because 5800H and 3050Ti combinations are typically seen in gaming devices that weigh more than the Swift X and hence have better cooling and have higher power limits, allowing them to achieve better scores even if the parts are similar. As a result, the Swift X sits in between the two systems for the overall score, but it's a bit closer to the 5800H system because of its dedicated GPU. The next test we have is 3D Mark Time Spy, and the Swift X sits in between its two competitors in all categories. It outperforms the 5800U system in the CPU test by 19%, while handily beating it in the graphics test by a factor of over 3 though it still falls short of the 5800H system by 24% in the CPU test and 35% in the graphics test, leading to an overall result 3.89 times better than the average 5800U system, but 34% worse than the 5800H system. Like last time, it's in the middle of the pack, but closer to the 5800H laptop. It's a similar story again in 3D Mark Firestrike, where the Swift X beats the 5800U system in the combined and graphics test significantly, by a factor of 4 and 3.3 respectively, while falling short in the CPU-dependent physics test by about 9%. It scores about 30% worse than the 5800H system in all categories as well, which gives it an overall score about 30% lower than the 5800H system, but over 3 times better than the 5800U laptop. These are intriguing results to say the least. From these preliminary benchmarks, it seems that this laptop does not perform as well as a full-on gaming laptop with similar specs, but it also considerably outperforms an equivalent CPU-only system. It fills a middle ground between Ultrabook and gaming laptop performance quite nicely, while remaining within the Ultrabook weight class. So now that we've established our performance baseline, let's now see how this 5800U keeps up with other CPUs, starting with the single-threaded CPU tests. In Cinebench R15 and R20, the 5800U in this machine is quite underwhelming compared to its competition. It gets beaten by all the equivalent Tiger-like Intel CPUs, with their best scores at 14% faster in R15, set by the 11370H, and 15% faster in R20, set by the 11800H. Not a negligible amount. On the AMD side, it just edges out the 5700U, while the 5800H outperforms it by about 10%, which is odd, because the 5800U uses Zen 3 cores like the 5800H and shares the same 4.4GHz single core boost. So theoretically, it should be equal to that CPU in this test. Curiously, in Geekbench 5, it's noticeably faster than the 5700U by about 13%, and roughly equivalent to the 5800H, which should be the case. It still gets beaten by all the Tiger Lake CPUs though, with the 11800H attaining the best score out of all laptop CPUs at about 12% faster than the 5800U. Now for the multi-threaded tests, and in Cinebench R15 and R20, our 5800U is actually slower than the 5700U by about 3-4%, while the 11800H and 5800H, being 8-core CPUs with much higher power limits, get away with scores about 40% better than the 5800U. Intel's lower-powered Tiger Lake chips, however, get absolutely wrecked by the 5800U, because apparently Intel still believes that 4 cores in a high-end laptop chip is competitive in 2021. In Geekbench 5, the 5800U again creams both 4-core Intel chips, which is no surprise. It did manage to edge out the 5700U in this test though, but it's still no match for the 11800H and 5800H with their higher power limits. And speaking of power limits, let's now see how the 5800U in this machine is tuned to behave under an all-core load. 
To do this, we're running a CPU-Z stress test along with Hardware Info 64, graphing CPU temperature, TDP, and clock speed. We initially have a brief jump to 3 GHz during the short burst period, which reaches a peak TDP of 25 watts at 95 degrees. This temperature then stays constant for the rest of the test, while frequencies and TDP gradually expire to a lower value of 2.6 GHz at about 19 watts. One thing to note here is that while Hardware Info didn't detect any thermal throttling, the clock speed and TDP values seem to be limited by CPU temperature through an internal throttling algorithm. Because after everything stabilizes, the TDP still slightly fluctuates and never actually settles on an integer value, which is what it should be doing if there are no other factors. At this point, we're pretty well acquainted with our 5800U, so let's shift gears a bit and check out where our 3050Ti lies in the hierarchy. First up, we have a chart showing the 3 d Mark times by graphics scores of several GPUs, and immediately you'll notice one thing. There are two 3050Ti's in here in completely different performance classes. This is the thing with the 30 series laptop cards. Because they have such a large range of possible power outputs, especially on the 3050Ti which ranges from 35 all the way to 80 watts, you'll need to factor in the TGP of the card to know approximately how it performs. The 35 watt RTX 3050 Ti and the Swift X perform similarly to a 1650 Ti, while a 60 watt 3050 Ti is about 60% faster and reaches mobile 2060 and 1660 Ti levels of performance. Compared to typical Ultrabook IGPs such as the Vega 8 and Iris G7, the 35 watt 3050 Ti is over three times as fast, while being about twice as fast as a 25 watt MX450. Firestrike also produces a similar distribution, with our 35 watt 3050Ti roughly matching the 1650Ti while beating both IGPs and the MX450 by a huge margin, though it still falters when compared to its 60 watt sibling, which is about 50% faster and similar in performance to the mobile 1660Ti and 2060. All right. That's enough of the benchmarks, let's now move on to the combined stress test to see how this laptop handles a full CPU and GPU load. To do this, we have CPU-Z and the Heaven benchmark running simultaneously, along with Hardware Info 64 also graphing GPU temperature, clock speed, and TGP. The CPU immediately jumps to 2.7 GHz at about 22 watts, with temps at 95 degrees, which is toasty, and it does not get better once the short burst expires, as the CPU still maintains 95 degrees at 2.1 GHz with a 15 watt TDP. The GPU though could use its full 35 watt TGP while maintaining about 87 degrees, which is hot for a GPU, but not terrible considering that both the CPU and GPU are cooled with one fan. The fan itself wasn't too loud either, but there is a slight treble frequency that may make it easier to pick up on. While this laptop's internals can just about handle a combined load, its external temperatures weren't the best. The hottest portions were at the front of the laptop near the vent, and the left third of the laptop. And when I say hot, I mean hot to the point where I'd feel uncomfortable if I left my hand there for sustained periods. The keys near the left also got quite warm, but not hot enough to be intolerable. However, all this applies only to performance mode. We can improve thermal significantly by using the other profiles without much of an effect on performance. So let's check out how these profiles affect the laptop's behavior. First up, we have the CPU only stress test where we're comparing the 5800U sustained clock, temperature over ambient, and TDP across the three profiles. And all bars are scaled relative to performance mode. We don't see any differences in temperatures here as they are all pinned to their maximum of 74 degrees above ambient, so the different fan speeds between the three modes dictate the clock speed and TDP of the 5800U in each profile. Though because the fan speeds don't change that drastically, the TDP and clock speed of the CPU don't change much between profiles. There is a bigger difference during combined loads though. Here we're comparing GPU power and temperature as well, but the GPU remains at 35 watts regardless of what profile you use, while GPU temperatures increase with normal and silent modes because of lower fan speeds, though the increase is only minor. What's more interesting though is the CPU behavior. Going down to normal or silent mode reduces the CPU sustained power from 15 watts to 10 watts, along with a minor reduction in clock speed from 2.1 GHz to 1.8. Our temperatures though decrease dramatically by more than 10 degrees, which is very noticeable from the outside even when gaming where the hotspots that used to be uncomfortably hot now become bearable. 
And speaking of games, I also tested Modern Warfare three times using each mode and averaged their results to check whether performance changes with each mode. And there is a minute gain in averages going from silent to normal mode, but almost no difference going to performance mode. So for light tasks or if you're in a quiet environment, I'd recommend silent mode so the fan stays virtually inaudible. For long rendering sessions, I'd recommend performance mode as you're not really going to be touching your laptop, and this will allow the CPU to boost more aggressively to cut down on those rendering times. For gaming though, I just use normal mode as temperatures are much better while performance is the same. That's why for the game tests, for the first time ever, we won't be using the highest mode available. Rather, we'll be using normal mode, which is a far more realistic use case. So let's play some games, starting with GTA 5. On the left is the MSI Afterburner overlay with CPU temperature, usage and clock speed, GPU temperature, usage and clock speed, along with CPU and GPU power and frame rate. I'm playing on very high settings and performance is good with an average of 56, a 1% low of 41, and a 0.1% low of 25. Next up we have Modern Warfare. This first run is being played on high settings without ray tracing or DLSS, and we get decent performance with an average of 43, a 1% low of 29, and a 0.1% low of 8. And like always, ignore that 0.1% low because it's caused by stutters during respawns. With ray tracing on, we have a noticeable dip in frame rate to an average of 34, a 1% low of 23, and a 0.1% low of 6, which isn't fantastic. With DLSS on quality mode, we get a drastic improvement to an average of 58, a 1% low of 43, and a 0.1% low of 7. And if we turn on ray tracing along with DLSS, performance is still a bit better than with them both off, with an average of 48, a 1% low of 33, and a 0.1% low of 6. The next game we have is Apex Legends. I'm playing on very high settings and performance is good with an average of 60, a 1% low of 38, and a 0.1% low of 27. Finally, we have Monster Hunter World. This was played on high settings on DX11 and performance is decent with an average of 43, a 1% low of 31, and a 0.1% low of 26. Overall, I am pleasantly surprised at how well this managed to play AAA games, and on high settings no less. As expected from normal mode, thermals were acceptable with the CPU hovering in the low 80s and the GPU in the mid 80s. Very impressive for a device of this size. Finally, let's talk about competition. And at this price point, there's actually nothing else that offers a similar package. You can buy gaming laptops and thin and lights at this price, but as for something in between, a thin and light that also has the performance of a decent gaming laptop, nothing fills that niche better than this does. The closest thing comparable to this would be the ROG X13, which also has a 35 watt 3050 Ti, but a 35 watt HS processor, which will beat an equivalent U class processor. It's also slightly smaller, can be configured with more RAM and a wider gamut 4K screen, and it's even compatible with external GPUs up to a 150 watt mobile RTX 3080. It's probably a better overall machine in every way, except for the price, with an equivalently spec machine running you an extra 400 US dollars. Not to mention, it still looks like a gaming laptop, however muted its design is in ROG standards. My point is, the fact that you can get such powerful components in a compact laptop that looks like a normal business machine is amazing, and it's even more amazing that it's priced so reasonably. As a creator laptop, it does lack some crucial things that creators might need, such as more RAM, a wider gamut screen, or even an SD card reader. So while it's not a bad option for the price, there may be more suitable devices out there depending on what you do. However, as an everyday laptop for the average user that may want to game or do some creative work on the side, the SwiftX is phenomenal. With a near perfect balance of price, performance, and portability, there's no device out there quite like this. Thanks for watching guys. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and subscribing to the channel. And don't forget to hit that bell icon next to it so you don't miss any future videos. Links to buy the Swift X are available in the description. And if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to post them all below. Take care everyone, have a wonderful day, and I will see you in the next video.